Uh, good morning. First of all, I want to thank all the media that's here this morning. I'd also like to thank our legal counsel, um, Chantel Bryson from Potesio Law, joining us here today as well to give some opening comments. Uh, basically, um, Gull Bay First Nation will be today filing an action against Canada for inequitable funding of First Nation police services. My name is uh, Chief Wilfred King from Gull Bay First Nation, also known as Kias Zogging and Anishinaabek in Northern Ontario. We've been under a policing agreement uh, since 1991. Prior to that, we had our own police service since 1971. Throughout the years, um, our position has always been the real chronic underfunding of our police service, and it's causing great concern for our community because of community safety issues. We feel that as a community that we are legally entitled to equitable funding based on Section 15 of the Charter. I'll let our legal counsel um, uh, say her say our, our position, our legal position, and why we think this is necessary, and I'll answer any questions for you uh, after the uh, our legal counsel has her chance to outline what we're going to do. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chantelle Bryson, legal counsel for KZA on Charter and Human Rights and other matters of police accountability. For 20 years, Canada has been aware that it is constitutionally obligated to equitably fund public services in First Nation communities, despite its use of tripartite funding agreements between it, provinces, and First Nation communities. For decades, Canada has acknowledged the negative impacts of colonial external policing in First Nation communities and its own lack of funding for First Nation community policing. In its own reports as recently as 2022 and as reflected in multiple external review reports of its First Nation policing programs, including by the Federal, Federal Auditor General. Today, KZA announces its Charter Equality Rights Action against Canada, so Public Safety Canada, and its First Nation and Inuit Policing Program and First Nation and Inuit Policing Facility Program in the Federal Court of Canada. For knowingly and recklessly providing inequitable funding and creating substantially inadequate policing services in Ontario First Nation communities under the Canada-Ontario First Nation Policing Agreement. KZA is only one of 19 communities to utilize the FNIPP and FNIPFP as implemented under the OFNPA. In the most recent OFNPA renewal process just last week, Canada once again chose to ignore its legal obligations to provide substantively equitable police funding and services in First Nation communities. Instead, continuing to force inequitable remuneration, benefits and pensions upon First Nation officers and inequitable officer complement police services infrastructure, equipment, training and oversight on those officers and their First Nation communities. Every renewal is the same, take it or get nothing. And that's what happened again this year. There is simply no acknowledgement by Canada of legally required equity and funding to provide for officer and community safety. Canada's continuing flouting of its constitutional, fiduciary, human rights and international human rights obligations stands in face of the recent tragedies in James Smith Cree Nation, which very much like KZA is approximately 45 minutes away from the nearest external police force. Canada has now offered $42.5 million to that community to deal with the aftermath 
of not providing for equitable police services in the first place, which are due at law. Canada's flouting of its obligations is also in phase of the recent officer deaths within South Simcoe Police Service and elsewhere. They know the dangers officers face every day and these dangers are extremely heightened in First Nation communities. Further, Canada's flouting of its obligations is in face of a recent decision in Dominique v. Public Safety Canada, in which the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found the FNIPP and the tripartite funding agreements thereunder are discriminatory in failing to provide the federal funding required to ensure equitable and adequate police services in First Nation communities. The recent OFNPA renewal process is in face of all of this and Canada's own adoption of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which guarantees not only individual community member equity, but community equity in services in First Nation and other Indigenous communities, including all necessary financial resources. So that is why KZA is taking this step today. First Nation officers are forced to work alone, often without cell or internet service, without housing or a police station, without support staff or supervisory officers. They choose to serve their communities out of a desire to provide better than the colonial services they are offered to prevent harm, to keep people safe, and to get real answers to the missing and murdered. In return from Canada, they are paid far less than their provincial and municipal counterparts. They have no promotion opportunities despite years of service. They receive negligible benefits, including those for mental health, workplace injuries, and receive far less in pension. KZA as a community is faced with far less than adequate officer complement, infrastructure, equipment, and training. So KZA and its officers, of which it has three, with one on leave, are left in perpetual danger. And all of this, along with oversight, is dealt out by the colonial administrator of the inadequate and inequitable funding envelope, which is set arbitrarily by Canada. It is done without requirements for transparency of the overall OFNPA or individual community budgets. Though First Nation communities are actually the employers and responsible to recruit officers, fill leaves, address workplace complaints regarding safety and human rights and fulfill all arbitration tribunal and court orders. KZA is often left without any police coverage at all in face of the inequitable funding and the ambiguity in the OFNPA regarding OPP jurisdiction and its obligation to provide backup service and to enforce First Nation bylaws passed with full nation authority, including banishment orders. The forthcoming federal policing legislation calling First Nation policing an essential service will not change any of these conditions or circumstances. Very much like the child welfare jurisdiction legislation, there's no equitable funding attached and it's never discussed. That will simply lead to blame on the communities when bad things happen. So KZA will not wait to become a lawless enclave because the federal cabinet decides over and over and over that it would like to put its budget funds elsewhere instead of abiding by its constitutional, fiduciary, human rights and UNDRIP obligations to provide substantively equitable funding for First Nation policing and to fulfill its legal obligations of supporting self-determination, self-government and its promises of real reconciliation. Thank you.
We'll now take questions. So starting in the room, if you're online and you have any questions, please uh, use the raise hand function to notify us of your questions. If you're online and you have any questions, please use the raise hand function to notify us of your questions. Go ahead, Matteo. I, um, Matteo Sanchez, Centre Global Development. Uh, I know you spoke a little bit about Tammy, um, the officer, um, acted kind of in retaliation um, after stuff came forward. I'm just wondering if there is concern um, that, that that sort of behavior, that kind of petty aggression from OPP will continue without a strong um, uh, First Nation police force? Um, thanks for the question. I think it's uh, imperative that um, First Nations are in complete control of their own police service. I believe that if the First Nation is in control of that service, then you have accountability. I think that's so important. You have uh, transparency and accountability. And therefore, it's really important that First Nations must take full control of their police services. Thank you. I just want to follow up. Can you speak a little bit to the importance of that community sensitivity, um, you know, particularly in your community? Well, I think as First Nations people, uh, you know, we've been living under this colonial structure for so long and the racism that goes along with uh, the colonialism in this country. And uh, we feel as leaders of the community, uh, it's important that uh, one of your major functions in the community is public safety and uh, to hold um, people accountable within those uh, structures. And it's important that the accountability lies with the governing body of the community and the community members. Thank you. And there are no questions online, so this concludes the press conference. Ceci m'est fait à la conférence de presse. Merci. Oh, hold on. We have a question online. Let me turn it on. Logan Tur Turner, go ahead. Please unmute yourself. Thank you for for this. I'm, I'm looking at Chief Wilford, can, can you speak a little bit uh, right now about the state of policing um, in Gulf Bay, what that situation is like currently? Uh, currently, we have um, a complement of three police officers. We have one that's on extended sick leave. So therefore, we only have two officers that are on duty. Uh, because of the low complement, there are times when we have no police service whatsoever. And in fact, um, we rely on the external police service of the OPP, which is approximately 45 minutes north of us to assist uh, our community in times of emergencies. And because of the low complement at the Armstrong Detachment, um, because of other issues, uh, there is no police protection in our community at times. And in fact, in recent incidents where we had um, a violent offender in the community, uh, the police would not respond because they could not get the necessary backup from uh, from Armstrong or Thunder Bay Detachment. So that's a real serious concern when you when you have two OPP officers in attendance on, a, on an incident and yet they're reluctant to execute an arrest because of uh, officer safety. And, uh, and they couldn't execute that arrest because there was no other officers that could assist uh, them in terms of their safety. So it, it really is a very serious situation in our community when you have um, no, no complement in your community and if you're relying on an external service um, and when they cannot um, assist you, it, it's a very dire situation. I'm not sure if I only have two questions or more, um, so I might just throw two questions at you here. Um, but uh, how often, I mean, you just described one situation where um, a violent offender wasn't, the uh, police weren't willing to respond. How often does that situation occur in Gull Bay? And I think my second question, if I can throw a double barrel one at you, is um, uh, why file this charge challenge now? You mentioned that this is an issue that's been going on for years in, in Gull Bay, so why? Why file this now? Um, the first question is, it happens more often than not. Um, we have known where our officers couldn't execute an arrest um, and because they had no backup in the community. And in fact, um, there are times when uh, offenders were, were basically allowed to commit crimes and walk away. And in fact, there are many instances where you have people that have... Uh, bench warrants for their arrest and yet uh, the officers couldn't execute uh, the arrest because of their safety. Um, I hope that answers your first question. The second question is that um, 
we've been fighting this since 1991. Um, it isn't a recent vintage. And uh, w when they, the federal government um, has you over the barrel because they provide the funding. And if you try to negotiate uh, the agreement in good faith, they often will tell you, well, if you don't sign the agreement at the end of this fiscal year, you will not get funding for the next year. And therefore, it puts your whole community at risk. So it's an unfair advantage when the federal and provincial government holds the purse strings, and yet uh, we're, we're bound by that agreement. And there's no room for all of these issues that we raised in terms of equitable police funding. Thank you. And Logan, if you have more questions, I'm okay for that. So would, um, I'm wondering as well, then, what do you make of um, the public minister, safety minister, uh, has recently made comments um, saying that they want to uh, move towards uh, expanding legislation, putting legislation into place um, to improve the First Nations policing program. What was the question? Um, yes, we're aware of that. Uh, it's legislation that's in the works and it's pending. Uh, however, our concern is that we cannot wait for that legislation. I think it's important that Galbi First Nation has to know what, what is the funding envelope that goes along with that legislation. And so far, uh, we haven't got any indication in terms of that commitment for equitable funding, even though the legislation is pending. And I'll, just, I'll just chime in there, Logan, that um, every public service in First Nation communities is basically delivered under an arbitrary funding envelope set by Canada, which the province then takes uh, to measure their contribution. And surely they have conversations about that behind the scenes. Um, and then there's just not enough to go around. <laughs> you know, we have officers in KZA that don't have housing. We have one officer that was driving back and forth three hours each way from Thunder Bay. Um, and another officer who sleeps on a friend's couch. You know, they don't have cell phones. They don't have sat phones, absent cell phone service. Um, there's a complete lack of clarity between um, the First Nation officers' jurisdiction and a lack of respect for their jurisdiction, uh, where the OPP arbitrarily decides to provide or not to provide service or some kinds of service. And again, there's no transparency as they are the appointed administrator of the funding envelope. Um, there's no transparency of any OFNPA budget or community budget to the communities. Um, and then, you know, simple things like a simple dispute arises or an arbitration, um, you know, over inequitable or a human rights complaint over inequitable pay. And that all comes out of the funding envelope, too, and then affects every community served by that funding envelope. Um, so after 20 years of the bad faith of Canada in this regard, because, again, they're doing it knowingly, it's it's been spelled out much like in the child welfare situation, it's been spelled out over and over and over by their own reports, the federal auditor general, academic reports, et cetera. They know. Um, and they hold the acts over the necks of the communities. You know, it's either this or nothing, right? And again, um, flying in to drop 42.5 um million after the fact is not the answer to officer safety and community safety. The answer is equitable police service in the community with a full officer complement comparable to other communities in similar situations um, with full pay, with the full benefits that all other officers receive, including mental health, especially. Um, and pensions and a proper police station and proper communications equipment and proper information technology and uh, proper training, um, not just when Canada or the OPP feel like there's a few pennies left in the bin to hand it out to one of the communities. And you bet the communities that speak up about inequity don't get the extra pennies. So... And this concludes the press. Oh, do you have another one? 
Sorry, just my last question is just, yeah. um, have you or will you seek a meeting with the um, Canada Minister uh, while you're in Ottawa to discuss this? Um, we think that by launching the case today, we'll obviously uh, create some interest in where Gulby First Nation is taking this case. Um, I believe uh, Minister Medestino will be at the Assembly of First Nations uh, gathering this week. And um, uh, I believe that once this case is launched, um, I also sit as the uh, co-rep for Ontario Region for the ONFNPA communities. And I brought this up at our committee meeting last night. They're well aware of this case that we're bringing forward and are very supportive. And uh, we're hopeful that um, we will, um, uh, once this case is launched, that it will grab the attention of this government. Thank you. And this concludes the press conference. This is my final conference of press. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Miigwech.